Hey, Leo. Hey, Lucy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for being on my podcast. Ah, thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, you're my eighth guest, and yeah. I'm excited. Ah, likewise. Yeah, that's. Um, I want to mention your podcast, and because I don't want to ask you any questions you've been asked before. Sure. You've been on Foodies Reviewing Movies with Callie yeah. Matthews and um, Bluegrass Region Voices and Views with Tom Haley. And yeah. so if you, can you give my audience or whoever's listening like a little snippet of your podcast? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, the 13th Floor, we're a paranormal occult conspiracy type podcast. And uh we have two unique uh, components to that. One, we we play a little bit more for laughs. We don't poke fun of the theories, but we're we're more comedy centered. And yeah. also, um, we let our listeners have a tremendous agency over what we talk about. All of our episode topics are a hundred percent listener submitted. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. um, we call you... it feeding the vase because uh, at the end of an episode, we'll draw from a vase our requests, and then that's what we talk about next time. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, are you taking a break from the podcast for a little bit? Because I noticed you haven't uploaded sure. in a yeah. Funny enough, uh, so I have two co-hosts, and they're both married, and they had baby number three in December, and they had baby number two uh, the spring prior to that. So they've been very inundated with <laughs> parental responsibilities. But funny enough, uh, I think today. And of course, people will find out after the fact, but I think today we're starting our recording back after a lengthy hiatus. So yeah, See, so I'm exciting. keeping the, the earphones warm. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. Thanks. I was just listening to your last episode and that's what I love, like how you all are like genuinely friends and have been friends from uh, like that. I like what you. Holly said is like just listening to her friends, like have a conversation like, yeah. And, and funny enough, me and Callie and Alex and Cece, we all met in the same screenwriting class at UK. So we all met at the same time. It was kind of like this weird little breakfast club situation. Yeah, that's cool. I really like Thanks. It. And that's what the name of it is, the 13th floor. Um, mm. I'm curious of why or what is your understanding of why people are afraid of that number? Because I know like uh, apartment buildings, they, that's they don't have a, a 13th floor. Yeah, and, and funny enough, before I even delve into that because that's a that's a deep little concept mm -hmm. um in the east it's it's the number four because it's a homonym for death so there's no fourth floor in japanese hotels for example oh. uh which that one we know we know that it's a homonym for death shin sounds like death and it also sounds like four we don't really know for sure and that's part of why we wanted the name we don't really know why 13 is unlucky there's a lot of theories, uh, but we really don't know. It's a very interesting number. It's in the Fibonacci sequence, for example. But uh, there's two theories that I've heard, actually three. One, uh, and this one I'm less likely to give credence to, but uh, lunar solar calendar used to be the most common way of reckoning time. Mm -hmm. And when you follow a lunar solar calendar, usually because there's like 12.46 cycles uh, per year, mm -hmm. That means occasionally you get a 13th month in a lunar solar calendar. And oftentimes it's considered like a portentous month, like, you know, good or very bad things can happen as a result of this mysterious 13th month that shows up. Um, another theory is that uh, Judas Iscariot was the 13th guest at the Last Supper. And similarly, in a way that parallels that in a really weird way in uh, European paganism, there were 12 Asir or gods that were having a feast and Loki turned up as the 13th guest and really wrecked the whole day. And it ended with ultimately the death of Baldur, the God of light. And uh, so there's a lot of theories, but we don't know. That's what makes 13 such an interesting number. That is very interesting. That's um, two things. Like I, I remember when they tried to have like the 13th um, horoscope or the 13th like sign. Ophiuchus. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a, that name. Um, and I don't know. I heard recently that that's, Taylor Swift's favorite number because she was born on 13th. I uh, like threes. I really like threes. But it's yeah. just, I'm like, that's Taylor Swift's favorite number. I wonder if she knows anything about that. Uh, it's a good question. And, and funny enough, yeah, I remember there was a lot of humdrum about uh, Ophiuchus, the snake holding um, sign, partly because people in the West associate snakes with, you know, de demons and the devil and all that. 
And then also because everybody acted like it was this new thing, but it's been in and out of astrological circles for a long time, probably, probably five, 6,000 years. It's been kind of bandied about. Yeah. That makes sense. Like, I didn't think it would just come out of nowhere. Like, yeah. however long ago like I remember it being in like newspapers and stuff like yeah yeah I think that was just a slow news year or something which <laughs> goodness I, I miss those I miss snow, slow news years <laughs> yeah, that's funny I actually heard um yesterday like randomly um it was the first time in maybe seven years that Chicago had no shootings oh wow interesting my sister dm'd that to me and I'm like wow because my brother lives in Chicago so I mean yeah. I mean, that's like a pretty big deal. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, it's funny, the 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 collective consciousness uh, of people and how it influences things. I wonder what the reason was. There's a there's there's a fascinating experiment going on actually uh, called the Global Consciousness Project. Mm-hmm. And it's um it shows this little dot and it basically organizes a series of random numbers. And when they start to develop more and more order to them, and I could be misinterpreting this. Uh, which that's actually a warning on the website. Do not strongly interpret the dot. But uh, the redder it gets, the more random. And the bluer it gets, the more orderly. And people have noticed that really, really notable phenomena since, tends to happen when it's blue. So I wonder if maybe it was blue this weekend. So I wonder. That's what I know. Um, I'm not exactly sure right now, but I know the sun's in Pisces right now and mm. the was in Scorpio. So just like... Or, I don't know, just like two water signs and it being like very flowy and calm. I wonder mm-hmm. if it just needed like a break. I was towards leap day the other day. I'm not exactly That's... sure if it was yeah. on that day. Um, mm. Yeah, that but... might have been it too. Maybe it just thrown people off. <laughs> I know, it's a confusing what... day. I'm not going to shoot anybody. That's what it's been a, like an interesting um, like week and past few days um, mm. for me, at least. But like for other people, I've just... I've seen a lot of changes recently. I like Interesting. it. Yeah. Hmm. So I do have some questions for you. I mean, sure. to say how we met, we met through the Lexington podcasters group and yeah, I did have one question that came up for me and I'm like, cause I've, I mean, I've read these questions. I made them last week and I'm sure. like, I really asked all those, but um, <laughs> I, like, what is something you've learned in podcasting? Because you've been doing it for some years now, longer yeah. than. Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing for me, and full disclosure, I get to say this because I don't do editing or anything, so I get to be lazy about it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I I think a lot of people get paralyzed, focused on quality and the minutia of getting mm-hmm. it uh, perfect. And I think that's great. I think people should have an emphasis on having a quality product because you're putting yourself out there. But at the same time, I think it's better to have something mediocre at first and learn to polish it over time than just getting analysis paralysis. I see analysis paralysis really mess up more endeavors, not just podcasts, than just about anything else, it seems. That's a really good answer. That I completely Thanks. agree. That's what I have always wanted a podcast. And I think the analysis paralysis like stopped me. And, and then like just sure. doing it is really like, how you overcome things and do it. Yeah. Just going head on and doing it. So yeah. that's a really good answer. Thanks. Um, has, is there anything you've learned about yourself particularly? I'm just curious. Cause my uh. advice is a lot about like, like I'm learning about myself every time I do a podcast or every yeah. time I talk to someone, I learn so much about myself or watching or listening to myself. I'm like, what? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've, I, it's, hard to put into words really, but it's very fun, especially when you have co-hosts, because sometimes, quite often even, I'll say something and I'll think it's just such a normal statement and they'll they'll call me out. They're like, that's kind of a peculiar thing. And I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. And it, it just gives you a better lens to a clearer lens to kind of view your own actions and thoughts and beliefs. And, and it's even more fun to go back on older things when you were a slightly different person and realize like, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly the same person as I was than when this aired. That's a really good answer too. That's really good at <laughs> this. You can tell me. Uh, thank you. While. That's, um, yeah, I've learned about myself a lot too. And mm. I forgot what else I was going to say. Um, 
no that's that's it's great though it's i i think that's one of the real joys of life is is evolving and being able to step back and see that evolution and process yeah um and that's what's nice to have it on camera to like look back and record because our memories can be so messed up but i remember what i was going to say you about you said something about um like people are shocked by the things you say. I feel that too a lot. I'm like, this is this isn't normal. Like you don't think like this. Like you don't have a question like this. Like yeah, it, that would be interesting with co-hosts. Yeah, having having talked to you a bit at the the podcasters lunches, I'm I'm not particularly surprised. Yeah, yeah, that's, in, a, in a good way though. That's um, I think, I mean, with your interest in like the cult or just like things that other people aren't interested in like I've always found freedom of expression in that because mm -hmm. I always like the underdogs or just things that aren't mainstream like yeah that are left out or like looked down upon like I've always yeah. like gravitated towards that and the interest in that has um you're growing up like did your parents like were they ever like super against that or very um okay. yeah i grew up in a very um conservative and, and and i don't mean conservative negatively but also in many respects backwards kind of community and mm -hmm. for me and we'll we'll touch on this later i'm sure mm -hmm. but i was always sympathetic to the creatures that uh, people viewed as literally evil in my community, like cats were evil, praying mantises were evil, spiders and bats were evil, bees were evil. Um, and so you're supposed to kill animals that were quote unquote diabolical. Yeah. And I was always a, a, just such a big fan and drawn to those animals for that very reason. Um, but yeah, I was definitely a square peg in a round hole growing up <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it that's what if people don't know you are a twin which is like yeah a special a twins run in my family my sisters uh. are my nephews and my great grandparents like um uh. does she have the same interests as you like how similar are you all or we twins? are very different like we we get along on things and and we we quote movies to each other and things like that but what our interests are extremely divergent um uh, and fun little paranormal fact, you know, I grew up in a house where having a poltergeist was considered normal. Like that was so, so paranormal things were just part and parcel of life for me. Both two of my grandparents were root workers, AKA hillbilly witches. Oh, yeah. um, and well, witch and a wizard respectively, if you want to get deep on the details. Um, but fun fact about me and my twin sister, and this is very unfortunate. I don't know anybody else who can say this, but we actually have a one-way street form of twin empathy. She does not feel anything that I experience, but I know if she's got a headache or, or having a bad day or anything immediately because I get phantom sensations. One of the weirdest examples of that was uh, when I was in college, she was, she, she was still back at home uh, in Southeast Kentucky. And she, I didn't know she was having her wisdom teeth out that day and I had to get to class and I woke up and I was, insanely dizzy and nauseous and just kind of like my brain wasn't working I felt loopy and out of it and I was queasy and I was I ended up getting sick and I went back to bed thinking I was dying and uh later that afternoon when I got to feeling better I gave her a call just to see how she was and she was like yeah I had my wisdom teeth out today the dentists were actually freaked out they were like they'd never seen anybody just come out of twilight totally lucid and not dizzy or or anything it's like well I think I know why so uh yeah that was that was a weird one that that's very interesting that's what I can I like have the ability to like feel a lot um mm. I'm very cancer and very like 12th house um mm. and that's I don't have a twin but like I feel sure. with that yeah. it's very interesting yeah and yeah, being I'm, empathic one of the funny things I've noted is I don't like watching people get hurt and it always annoys me when I see somebody uh, fake wince and they're happy and they're like, Ooh, that's going to hurt. And it's like, you don't think that hurts at all, but it does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I have like the ability to like see like very fake stuff too. And I don't mm. like it. And I've like have yeah. worked on my people pleasing, like growing up like that and that being like my normal. And I'm like, just being so authentic is like so much more freeing. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Like you're not going to be you who will. I know that's cliche, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. And it's hard when you kind of don't even know yourself because it's like you've been like someone else or trying to be someone else for like other people like for a long time. It's like, who? Yeah. Like that's been my self discovery journey for the past few years. Yeah. One of the ways I like to look at it, and I, I beat this horse to death. I've said this to too many people, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like my little Leoism or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, the word for person, comes from the word persona, which means mask. And I think it's an accurate word because, you know, we all play different roles at different times. We don't talk to our friends the same way we talk to our parents or our doctors. And, you know, there's always a different role. I always think of times where uh, when you're a kid, you know, sometimes you forget and, you know, you'll talk to the teacher like they're your friend or something. And there's this weird awkwardness because it's like, oh, I, I'm wearing the wrong mask right now. I... Uh completely agree um so you were frozen uh -oh. for a second looks like i froze <laughs> yeah. there we go i'm back okay yeah that's um, um and i i think i'll go for it oh i was just gonna lead into the astrology because that's really what helped me understand oh, sure. all the persona stuff like mm. uh, all the houses i'm like this is myself this is myself this is what make helps me feel secure this is me with like my siblings me in relationships mm -hmm expressing myself at home I mean I could go through all 12 but I mean interesting yeah and that's why I keep learning more and more about astrology every day like I think like I mean you could study it for like 10 years 20 years and not know everything like you're it's constantly learning especially with all the transits and everything but um yeah. like the persona charts have you heard about that like I mean no, that's interesting because the main one we look at is the sun persona chart. And then there's a moon, there's a Venus persona chart, Mercury. Mm. And that's like describes more in depth of like your mind and your beauty or love. And then like mm. midheaven persona chart. Like I learned that like a few months ago and I've been kind of like into sh learning about astrology since like 2020. Mm. Um, so seems like a lot of people's new interests really, really peaked in 2020. That's the one silver lining from all that. Yeah. I, th I mean, that's like I mean with corona and everything like that yeah. I think that's really where I started like changing yeah. like people couldn't go out so they had to, to had to look in and see what they wanted yeah. yeah um so what is one of my other questions um that's very interesting about your family that's um so they yeah. were very religious but you had grandparents that were like and yeah yeah there were some peculiar things that unfortunately because of that transition to uh, uh a more stringent religious view some things have been lost like uh my grandma on the spring equinox every year would eat four duck eggs she was originally like i mean she was born in america but her parents were from austria or her grandparents so there has to be some reason why she would eat four duck eggs on the first day of spring yeah. None of her children has been able to answer that question. I'm like, why did she do that? And I'm like, I don't know. It says weird heathen stuff. <laughs> That's what they would call it, heathen stuff, which is a bastardization of heathenry. So, yeah. <laughs> she never explained it or anything? Mm -hmm. No, never explained it. She was devoutly religious, by the way, but, you know, she just brought some of the, the old ways with her, and they, they unfortunately got lost within that generation. That's interesting. Um, so... Were, did you say your parents were like, um, like studied the Bible and like that type of religion or? It was really more of a community view of, you know, these are the norms and you don't stray outside of the norms. And within a very short span of time, those norms got more strict and uh, uh, oppressive feels a little too negative to call it. But just uh, there was a weird pocket culture that formed that the previous generations didn't have and subsequent generations don't have. And I think it was just not very conducive to being open-minded or being creative or, and especially from my view, because that's my big passion is animals, uh, really caring about nature at all. You know, it was, it was kind of the roundup generation, <laughs> you know, like we'll poison it all because it's all the devil. So, yeah. That is so interesting. Like I, have a fascination like with cults like and that's uh, culty and yeah no there's definitely a culty element to it yeah like if you don't believe what i believe then you're wrong and you're yeah. going to hell or just i don't know like don't associate with other people like that seems like 
very the opposite of what like we should be doing I yeah think. yeah absolutely I, I think any ideology um there's a tightrope walk I think there's a danger on both sides I think you could either purity spiral like they did to the point where you don't incorporate any new ideas you panic at the prospect of new information and as a result you just stagnate and eventually decay and, and it goes away and then the other hand though you can also be so open that you dilute that ideology and then ultimately it just kind of, kind of stops being a thing just because there's there's nothing really to compare it to uh, i think they're both equally dangerous it's just more a question of finding a good balance between maintaining a view and and also maintaining a healthy interface with the rest of the world that has different views. Yeah, I I think balance is like a universal law, but like something mm. we need, like yeah. two on one side. That was a good way of like explaining it. Thank you. Yeah. What is one of my other questions? Oh, I love asking, I asked Callie this and I've I kind of want to like ask every guest, like, what is your favorite color and number? A hundred percent on the color, it's it's green, particularly Kelly green. But I love all shades of green. In fact, yeah. I, I, the listeners can't see this, but if I stop video, you can see that my logo is green, <laughs> so green and black, uh, which are my two favorite colors. The yeah. way they pop with each other. Um, number wise, I got two favorite numbers. One is thirteen because it's so mysterious, and I've always been also drawn to nine. Uh, you know, it's three cubed, it's uh, uh, associated with European folklore, and it's just, I don't know, it's just a nice number to me. Yeah, uh, when I think of nine, I think of like endings and kind of like mm -hmm. knowledge, like um, I think Sagittarius is the ninth one, and that mm -hmm. like represents like big adventure, open-mindedness, knowledge, um, mm -hmm. you're seeking, I don't know. Um, Interesting. yeah. That's what I feel like everything has like some type of meaning, but we can't look too much into it. And, you know, sure. it, it yeah. is all like our perception too. like we bring our perception or project right. to it. That's that's one issue I have when people incorporate numbers and numerology to like conspiracies, because you can do that with literally anything. You could yeah. you could find some occult association with a number, you know, some football players jersey doesn't necessarily mean he's in the Illuminati. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I've definitely been uh, like gone through phases where I'm like too obsessed. Like when it first like started being interest to me, like like it's one, two, three right now. And like I would just look up like every single number and like what's the meaning to this? What's the uh, meaning? What's the angel number meaning? Like I was sure. way too obsessed with it. Interesting. Yeah. Um well, I know you have a background in psychology, uh both from hearing it and also your hat, but yeah. um, have you ever read uh, Synchronicity by Jung? Um, I think I've heard of it, but no, I haven't. It read. is a real trip. Um, it's, it is not a fun read, I'll say that, but it's a very interesting read, and it's a really short, that's the, the weirdest thing. It's, it's teeny tiny little book, but I could only read a few pages at a time because it was just so cerebral and complex that I was just like, okay, I'm gonna take a break from this, yeah. but it was very interesting. Huh. I, I want to write that down. That's cool. I will look into that. Um, my next question mentioned like you're your own boss. I think that and you have been your own boss since forever. Or yeah. Yeah. yeah the, is that something you always wanted? Uh... It's kind of a funny answer because I don't know how to not be my own boss. Um, and when I talk to people who are entrepreneurial and they kind of get it, you know, I feel kind of at home. And then sometimes I'll talk to people and because I know most people uh, aren't. And it's just so alien to me. Like, I can't even imagine it. I can't imagine the alternative where it's like, you know, you clock in and you, you have to report back to somebody about every little thing. And it just, it sounds awful to me. It, it's, Sounds like being a veal calf or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, I grew up on a farm and and then I started my own business after that. So in both cases, I didn't really report to anybody. You know, you just do what you need to do and call it a day. That I really, like, I agree with you on that, like how I feel. Like I have like worked for other people and I do, I feel trapped. I feel like I can't mm -hmm. be myself and 
as well, I will often like try to do my own thing and then bosses have like been mad at me I've been mm -hmm. I don't know if reprimanded is the right word but like yeah it's been so annoying and frustrating and that's why I was like after my last job like I I was like I'm done I'm done like yeah. I'm kind well, of some of it, and this is a little bit of a mini rant, but one of the reasons why I think office culture is just so toxic for a lot of people is poor management. Uh, because a manager is supposed to manage people. They're supposed to motivate people. They're supposed to understand people. Um, I think you and I, for example, from from what it sounds like, you know, we're both very empathic, would be pretty good managers. But most people, they just want somebody who has done a good job at what they did prior and then they promote them. And that could be a nightmare for a business, especially if it's an engineer, for example, it's like engineers don't usually like interfacing with other people. Why would you reward, I'm using air quotes, uh, an engineer by promoting to, to manager and now they got to do something that's totally out of their wheelhouse. And I've seen it just destroy companies by having poor management where they, they kind of tyrannize the employees instead of motivate them. And then it kind of goes to pot. So I think that's a big chunk of it. Uh, that's, I mean, I see that like nationally, globally, mm. like people not under being good with their power. Or, yeah. A manager's it, not supposed to be a sheepdog for people. Um, you know, that, that works for sheep. It doesn't work for, for people. Yeah. Um, that's what learning astrology has helped me. Like I, it has made sense to me, like, I have like a zero degrees Aries med heaven, which is like the start of everything. And I, mm. my Lilith is in like sixth house, um, which is like the area of work. And I don't know, it's really mm. made a lot of sense to me, but I thought it was fascinating when you, I heard you say you've always been your own boss. Like I really admire that. And thank you. I think, I don't know. I just really like that. Oh, thanks. Um, oh, the tarantulas. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever, so you've never been scared of them or have you? Not really. And it, it's funny though, yesterday I did something incredibly stupid. So these are, these are really skittish animals. That's what they are. You know, people tend to think of them as these little monsters, but they're just animals. And they're, they're usually way more afraid of human beings than the other way around. But one thing to note and this is an important little caveat. These are wild animals. And I, the human being, made a decision to keep some in my home, which means if I did get bitten, it's 100% my fault, 100% on me. Uh, but there's two kinds of tarantulas. There's new worlds from the Americas and the Caribbean, and there's old worlds from Africa, Australia, Europe, uh, uh, Asia. Okay. So in other words, just like there's you know new world, old world, Columbus type stuff, um, the New World tarantulas, which I have six, they're very chill. Uh, they're they're pretty calm, just behaviorally. They have these little hairs on the back of their butts that they will. They, it looks like you know when people make it rain, they'll scratch it and it'll make this little tuft come up. It almost looks like somebody blew on a dandelion, mm -hmm. and those little hairs are very irritating. And it's actually what itching powder is made of. It's literally made out of ground up tarantula hairs. That's their first line of defense. They're very chill normally. And if they get really upset, they might kick hairs at you. And that's not a big deal unless you put your face right in their butt, because then, you know, you could get the hairs in your lungs or eyes, but that's almost impossible if you're not crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they do manage to bite you, it's incredibly mild. It's like a bee sting. I used to keep bees too. And, you know, I'd actually never been stung by bees, which I'm shocked, but um Really? It's not a big deal though. You take a Benadryl and you get back to work. It's it doesn't even ruin your day. Oh. Old worlds, on the other hand, they don't have urticating hairs. They are a lot more defensive because they evolved in areas where there's just a lot more predators that are mammals like us, and so their venom is what is called medically significant. Now it doesn't mean you'll it'll kill you. In fact, nobody has ever to date died from a tarantula bite. It seems like it's not even possible, but it will cause you a lot of pain, fever, heart palpitations, nausea, terrible muscle cramps. I, I know a woman who was bit by uh, an OBT, which is what I'm about to talk about. And she'd also given birth with an epidural. And she said that she'd much rather give birth without an epidural. Oh, really? So I, my OBT, Julius, uh, named after the orange Julius, they're all named after beverages. 
Uh I hadn't seen them in two weeks. And that's another thing about these pets is the reason why a lot of people like a lot of them. They're really cheap and easy to take care of. So 10 versus one's not that different, but also you don't see them every day. They're they're very uh, shy little animals. I hadn't seen Julius in two weeks. So I was like, Julius must be dead. There's something wrong. And Julius was just a baby, but something had to have gone wrong. So I decided, well, I'm going to clean out their enclosure. I'm going to see if I find their body just to confirm. So I get in and I'm, I'm rattling the enclosure. I take the lid totally off. I even leave the room at one point, which you should never, ever, ever do. Um, and I'm tearing up silk, which is like ballistic fiber. It's so thick with these tweezers. And I didn't find them. And I thought, well, shoot, I guess I'll try to find them later. So I put the lid back on. About 10 minutes later, they're repairing the damage that I had done <laughs> to their web. They could have bit me. They're, they're literally people joke they're calling orange bitey things because they're very defensive. I was incredibly dumb. I really put myself at risk. And I'm glad that it didn't end poorly because uh, you, you shouldn't make assumptions with a wild animal. <laughs> That's funny. That is so fascinating. That's, I don't have any tarantulas, but one of my first yeah. memories was like my preschool had tarantulas. Oh, so wow. Part of my first memories is being around them. Wow. Yeah. That is really unique. That's a, that's a very uh, progressive preschool. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> it was know, a back at my preschool, they would have killed it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout out Montessori. <laughs> huh. I guess Neat. they are more progressive. <laughs> huh. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And I'll go for it. Oh, you go for it. Uh, I was just going to say, it's it's fun to see that they all have personalities too. You know, simple a creature as they are. Uh, for example, the first one I ever got, Pumpkin, who's a uh, Tlotocaudal albopilosis, which is a mouthful, <laughs> Dominican curly hair, in other words. Um, okay. I just thought all tarantulas, because she was my first one, I thought they were just really prone to wash themselves. And later I found out that none of them really are that keen on it. Just her. Like she constantly, when I got her, when she was this big and now she's like almost the size of my hand, she washes up all the time. She'll even stand over her water dish if it's empty and wait for me to fill it up. And then when I fill it up, she'll take a bath in it. It's really cute to watch, but it's also, it's just her. It's not instinctive. It's not part of her species behavior. It's just something she does. Do you have any other female ones? Like that's not a gender, uh, you don't think? Or? Sure. Um, it's funny. It's really hard, actually. It's so easy to sex a regular spider, what are called true spiders. Tarantulas are real spiders, but it's a weird name. But no, don't worry about it. But uh, but tarantulas are really hard to sex. So I usually just say they, them when I talk oh. about my spiders, because I don't know half of them. Uh, pumpkin, I'm sure, though, because it's been so long and she's not molted out to be a mature male. That, that you know immediately because they uh, they have eight legs, as you know, and they have two body parts, an abdomen and a cephalothorax, and then they have two chelicerae terminating in fangs, and then they've got these little tiny legs right next to that. Some people even think, oh, well, that's got 10 legs. Well, those are called pedipalps, and they're little bitty legs. Well, the male genitals are in the ends of those pedipalps, so when they molt out as a mature male, which means they're not going to live very long, unfortunately, they have about a year to, to breed after that. They have these big boxing glove ends to those petty palps. So oh. that's that's when you know with 100% accuracy. The only other way is you got to examine their molt after they molt and look for a little furrow, a little flap, and that means they're a female. And it's just such a pain. And most of mine, they gnaw their molt into oblivion by the time I can get to it in the first place. So I just don't know what half of them are. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Did, have you had any breeding situations? Or? Um, unfortunately, uh, I, I actually got a pair originally. I got a, a Baggins as well, Tiltocado, or yeah, Tiltocado Baggins. Um, and uh, that is wrong. It's a <laughs> Baggins is a species name, but I can't think of the genus right now for some reason. But anyway, um, he m- molted out as a mature male. His name was Spice. And that was, that started the beverage trend, pumpkin and spice, pumpkin spice latte. Uh, Um, So I actually did send him to somebody who had a female, but unfortunately, even though they bred several times, it never resulted in uh, an egg sac. So no, no spice babies. uh, Oh, spice hmm. babies. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah. That's, um, I guess that was my last question. I didn't realize that. Um, Hmm. That's what I I think I remember you saying something about um having an animal podcast or like I yeah. 
it's it's not launched yet, but it's in the works because that is that is my real passion. Um, and right now I'm working on it more like it's a show because I kind of want to pitch it as a show initially. And if that doesn't pan out, I'm going to turn it into a uh, probably a vidcast. Actually, I've been experimenting a lot with um, uh, like VTuber technology, which is an interesting thing where you can create like a virtual avatar to talk about things. And it's it's your voice, but it's not your face. And I just think that would be a really fun format to educate people, especially kids, uh, about animals, because that's what got me into it. I'd wake up early and I'd watch The Crocodile Hunter or Jack Hanna, and Steve Irwin, um, you know, people like that. And it was just, you know, it, it was it introduced me to the fact that animals are wonderful things and not diabolical things. I, I really love animals, too. That's why I feel. Yeah. I love how. I mean, they don't really talk back to you, though they have personalities and you can yeah. see that's I'm like watchdogs a lot. And like my mm. in my bio is like, I love seeing each animal's personality. That's the fun thing about a lot of animals. And that's what got me into invertebrates is they're so alien that learning their body language is it's like learning to talk to somebody from Neptune or something. It's just different. Yeah. Wow. That's I mean, that's really cool. Thanks. I don't know if I mentioned this, like when we were out at the restaurant, I don't know, but I've been to, I did a safari one time and oh. I saw like elephants, monkeys, lions, That's awesome. up close, wild yeah. dogs. And it, I mean, that was like amazing. And like being yeah. in, in like this open Jeep and. Yeah. Was this Kenya or Namibia or. Um, It was South Africa. South Africa. Okay. Yeah. Nice. That's really cool. And, like, I don't want to say once in a lifetime because I want to do it again, but <laughs> it was amazing. And I mm. highly recommend, like, I don't really want to go to a zoo anymore just because sure. I, I hate the trapping in. I hate feeling trapped. I like at work too, like sure, people telling me what to do, like stuff. Yeah. But that's, I don't really want to support an aquarium or zoo again. Like seeing them in their element and like praying sure. like watching them how they operate like yeah. they something spot like i saw like a cheetah um or the other one i forget but um leopard yeah maybe a leopard mm. just like seeing their prey like it was amazing and seeing mm. them like, naturally i saw a couple of them like get together and breed or whatever yeah, sure but, well, well, that, that's one thing I got, I got mixed feelings about zoos, but it kills me when people point to animal behavior. Animal behavior is actually a big part of my job, funny enough, but seeing people use animal behavior references from animals in captivity, you know, oh, well, these animals do this. And it's like, no, they don't necessarily do that in a zoo. All bets are off on, on how they're going to behave. Yeah. That's just goes to show like how limited people's thinking can be when they don't step outside of the box and like, yeah. Like, you don't know everything. No one knows like, <laughs> exactly. anything, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I loved having this conversation with Thank you. Thank you, I'm likewise. Running low, so I don't want to sure. be like, cut off before I say, like... Nah, no you. worries. No, yeah. Thank you. It was great being on here. This was really fun. Yeah, I, I mean, I hope we can do it again. I'd love to. I'm very... Sounds good. Just let me know. Hmm? Yeah. So I'll see you in a couple weeks, probably. Sounds good. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Bye, Leo. Bye.